as I said, there's always costs to everything, and fatigue is one of the costs of hypertrophy training, just or training in general. So fatigue is a temporary reduction in the ability to do productive work. Something that's very common in the fitness industry is the whole team no days off sort of movement. You know, doesn't matter, I'm a warrior, I'm going to go in there and smash it. While it might feel psychologically like you're smashing it, physiologically you might not be pushing your body actually hard enough for it to grow. So if we're looking at progress, the ability to do the most amount of productive work we can as often as possible, fatigue is going to stop that. So managing fatigue is going to be very beneficial for your long-term progress. Fatigue in physical ability to do productive work, both within the session and subsequent sessions. It's like you can't squat, your 1RM at the start of the session is not the same as your 1RM at the end of the session. Same sort of thing as your 1RM today, if you're training legs, and then let's say you train legs, and then your 1RM tomorrow. You're gonna to be pretty reduced in your capacity tomorrow. When it comes to the training we're concerned with, there's three main types of fatigue. Central, peripheral, and muscle damage. Central fatigue. So this is fatigue, funnily enough, located in the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. It's caused by longer duration activity and muscle damage. With longer duration activity, yeah, come on. <laughs> With longer duration activity, that fatigues the central nervous system because it's got to send out a signal for so much. If you go on, what's a marathon, 42 Ks? Yeah. You run a marathon, your brain has got to be like leg, leg, step, 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 for so long, okay? That's fatiguing and it just gets a little bit depleted from sending those signals out all the time. When muscle damage comes into it, you do a really damaging workout, it's your body senses that the muscle fibers are damaged and at least a little bit fragile. It sends a signal back to the central nervous system being like, hey, don't contract your biceps really hard because otherwise you're gonna do more damage. It's like, you know when like a thread, you start a thread on like your clothing, once you get that thread, it, it gets going. Same sort of thing with the muscle fibers. When there's a little tear in them, a little tear becomes a big tear very quickly. So if you've trained biceps today, and you're like, nah, fuck it. Team no, day, no days off, I'm gonna go and smash biceps again, because it's all about working hard. Your body basically isn't gonna let you recruit what, it, what you want to recruit, okay? Those are damaged fibers, because those high threshold motor units, those ones that grow the most, they're the ones that also get damaged the most, okay? So, the impacts of central fatigue is a reduction of activated high threshold motor units and sub subsequently hypertrophy. And this can be a result of efferent and afferent factors, which is what I went over. So it's just one is signals going out, one is signals coming back. Long duration activity fatigues us from signals going out. Muscle damage fatigues us from signals coming back in. And same with peripheral fatigue, which I'll go over next. So recovery time is varied and it's mostly dependent on muscle damage. From central nervous system fatigue, you can back it up pretty quickly, actually. It's like it's only, say, hours to a day or so. A lot of powerlifters walk around and talk about how their CNS is fried. I don't know if you've heard that, but it's very common. Um, it's most likely not, to be honest. Peripheral fatigue. Now, this is located in the muscle. So we started at the brain and spinal cord. Now we're talking about the muscle. This kind of fatigue is caused by increased metabolites which alters the ion pump functioning, and that's just basically like calcium and sodium, how they're supposed to be either in the cell or out of the cell, depending on which one we're talking about. And when they start to get in the wrong balances, your body can't send the signal like it needs to, and reductions in glycogen. So the impact of peripheral fatigue is actually an increase in the activation of high threshold motor units, if sufficient neural drive is present. Okay, so if the signal's coming out and there's peripheral fatigue, that actually helps us increase the, the motor units we're talking about. So that's, that, that was that example of, as I said, when you fatigue out those fibers and then we get more and more and tap into the higher ones. So just think of this as like a higher rep set. As the fatigue accumulates, you start tapping into the fibers that you want to grow. 
what do we think might happen if we have high central fatigue and high peripheral fatigue? Will it increase or decrease our ability to activate high threshold mode units? So one helps and one hinders. Who wins? Central. Why is that? It's bigger. Like it's, it's, I don't know how to it. It's like it's in charge of more. Yeah, well, it, except for except where the signal starts from. It doesn't matter if you've been doing a ton of leg extensions, you, there's a ton of peripheral fatigue in your quads and they're ready to activate high threshold mode units if the signal doesn't even come from the brain. It's like there's got to be the signal there, then that kicks in. So if central fatigue will lock you out of the help of peripheral fatigue. So that's super frequent, no days off kind of training. We do need to let muscle damage and central fatigue decrease at least once in a while if we want to start tapping into this stuff. So, and the recovery time of peripheral fatigue is short, it's within 24 hours. Yeah, you can get a massive pump in your quads, supersets, drop sets, all that kind of stuff. The next day, you're gonna be pretty good, except for the muscle damage. But that's separate from this peripheral fatigue. Which leads us to muscle damage. And that's damage within the muscle, obviously, and that's either within the sarcolemma, which sort of basically like wraps the muscle fibers, kind of like glad wrap around the muscle fibers, or between the sarcomeres, which were those things that we looked at at the start. This is caused by high force mechanical tension, so lifting heavy loads, or chemical degradation, which goes back to that. So calcium is one of the things that gets released into the cell that tells it to contract. And basically when calcium starts hanging around in places that it shouldn't, it slowly erodes the muscle chemically. So it's like, a, you might do a really heavy set and that causes just tears because of the amount of tension and then the calcium thing and calcium and inflammatory neutrophils get in there and that starts eating away at that hole even more and the damage spreads. So this results in a reduction of activated high threshold mode units and subsequently hypertrophy. Recovery time. This can be dependent on how heavy you lift, fatigue, so how much you do or how close you go to failure, time under tension and exercise novelty. So you don't want to be cycling through your exercise and changing exercise every week, otherwise you'll be causing more damage than you need to. In order to grow, we need to stop causing damage at some stage and build on top of that repeated bout effect, which is where your body learns to protect itself. We're going to look at the mechanisms of, of hypertrophy. So mechanical tension is the mechanical loading that each individual fiber experiences due to force production. We've got mechanoreceptors, which sit on the cell wall or the membrane of the cell, and they transduce that signal, that mechanical signal, into a biochemical signal. That biochemical signal then goes off, raises muscle protein synthesis, it elevates, we grow muscle. Worth noting, Tension is not limited to just the longitudinal forces as we've sort of gone over. Yes, we think about tension end to end as you contract two points together, but that creates tension pushed outwards as well. It doesn't make a difference really to anything that you do. It's kind of cool to understand just how muscles function. Metabolic stress, so that pump, that burning. You know. This is the exercise induced accumulation of metabolites such as lactate, inorganic phosphate, hydrogen ions. Again, exercise biochemistry, you don't need to worry too much about it. This primarily occurs when anaerobic glycolysis is the primary source of uh, fuel for exercise. So basically when we're burning carbs for energy. If you've ever run like a 400 meters, that shit sucks. And that's because you're burning so much carbs that you're producing so much lactate and hydrogen ions. Uh, the proposed mechanisms for which metabolic stress causes hypertrophy are all these. So people talk about cell swelling, the accumulation of reactive oxygen species, elevated um, hormonal response, so you get like greater uh, growth hormone and things like this after doing uh, this kind of training, and altered myokine production, which is sort of like some inflammatory uh, like immune system things that are secreted from muscle cells. However, while all of these might contribute to a degree, based on what we know about mechanical tension, metabolic stress 
probably works mostly just by increasing fibre recruitment. So it's still tension that drives muscle growth. Metabolic stress just gives us an ability to tap into those high threshold mode units. Okay, does that make sense? So a high rep set can still make you grow and the pump is a great feeling, but the pump probably doesn't contribute independently to growth too much. It's just a good indication that you're training hard. Then we've got muscle damage. So a lot of people have said muscle damage creates, muscle damage leads to repair and growth. And it sounds good in theory, but there's a little more to it than that. So this is the exercise induced destruction and deformation of muscle tissue and supporting structures. It can occur on the level of individual fibers, all the way up to the larger like networking structures of the muscle. So the cause of damage, as we've gone over, seems to be a combination of direct tension and chemical degradation. This has implications for within the session and how frequently you train. So within the session, as I said, a tear can get bigger and bigger really quickly. Now some of the stuff Jacob will go over, we talk about how many sets probably is when those tears are starting to get out of control. Okay? Not that you can feel them and feel like it's a massive rip in your bicep, but you go in and do an arm session in order to grow your arms, yeah? But there becomes a point where you're probably doing more harm than good and breaking down more muscle tissue than actually you're signaling to grow. Or say, the frequency, just quickly I'll touch on that. Someone like Meadow Henselmans is a big proponent of high frequency training. And he can probably do that because if you're only doing one or two sets, you've barely created any tear and that tear is barely got a chance to get out of control. So you can do that pretty frequently, but maybe three sets is when that tear goes from small to moderate, okay? And doing three sets every next day or so, that starts to accumulate fatigue really quickly. So a lot of people get confused when they look at uh, maybe say like Jacob's training, he's only training twice per week, whereas someone like Menno might say to train six days per week for the same body part. And people go, what's better, six or you know, two? And it's gonna depend on how they structure their volume within the session, how much damage they accrue, and the implications of that. So, some of the details of damage. Muscle can undergo varied degrees of damage, and we must clarify terms. So basically, repair is when the muscle fiber gets a little bit messed up, and it can recover from that. Then we have something called regeneration, where you cause so much damage to the sarcomere that it basically needs to be dissolved and another one grown in its place. Okay, it's not kind of just patching it up, it's like tear it down, put another new one in. Both of those are quite energetically costly processes, but neither of those are synonymous with muscle growth. Okay, growth is adding more to what's there, not ripping it down or putting another one in its place. So sarcomeres can increase in size without first undergoing damage. So this gives us a bit of an indication that damage isn't the most important thing. And damage to one fibre does not improve our ability to build another. So it may not even have a compounding effect. So when someone talks about trying to do really damaging training, they're trying to grow muscle, it's at least something that we should be questioning. Yeah, you probably can't avoid damage because you've got to do hard training at some stage, but it's probably not something you want to maximise. And this is an example of that. Has anyone seen this before? Cool. So it's like one of my favourite slides to show. They did a study um, where they looked at, so this, these curves here are how high muscle protein synthesis was after they did a training session. So after their first training session, muscle protein synthesis for these participants was super high, okay? But, the yellow part of this is uh, referring to how much muscle protein synthesis was being directed towards repair. As we can see, so much of this was directed towards repair. Only this little green bit was directed towards growth. Now, as these participants continued to do the same training program, they got used to the exercise, the repeated bout effects kicked in. You know when a, a client comes back from holidays, they haven't trained legs, you train legs the first time they're sore for a week, then after a month or two of training, they do legs and they're not even sore the next day. That is where the repeated bout effect kicks in. Now, after 10 weeks of training, muscle protein synthesis, how much they're, yeah, that was elevated after a session, 
actually went down a little bit. But the amount that was going towards uh, repair was, it's basically nothing. So now all the muscle protein synthesis was basically going towards growth. So as we can see here with that green line, it you've got to adjust to a training program and then once you, your body's learned to protect from damage, that's where that training stress will really allow you to start accumulating actual muscle growth. Okay, so if you're changing programs every two or three weeks, your body's basically just learning to protect against the damage and then you change. And then it's a new form of damage. It's got to learn to protect against that. You want to start running programs for, we don't necessarily know how long because you adapt to a single bicep curl variant a lot quicker than what you adapt to a squat. So there's lots of factors at play here. What we can't be sure of is how much of this growth was actually supported by the damage that came before it. Let's say we tried to pick a training program, rather than doing squats, which created a bunch of muscle damage and RDLs or something like that, we just did leg curls and leg extensions. So there'd probably be less of this yellow part, but this overall curve would also be lower. So maybe by the time they get to week 10, this is only here, okay? So if you run a really damaging program, that's probably gonna set you up for more growth in the future, but you've gotta run it for quite a long time, okay? You don't wanna be doing a ton of damage in the short term and then jumping shift. 